join me in welcoming Tim Sturgeon. Thank, Thank you very much. So good evening and thank you all for coming out tonight. Appreciate seeing you all here. Um, as she said, I'm Tim Stroshane and uh, um, I have been a planner for about 21 years and have worked for the city of Berkeley, as she mentioned, as Wendy mentioned. And uh, more recently, I, I work for um, Restore the Delta starting in 2014 as a policy analyst. And, uh, but uh, this, event tonight is um, more reflects my, my labors as, uh, as Wendy mentioned, as an independent scholar and uh, an enthusiast about California history and particularly water history. Um, my thanks for publicizing tonight's event go to Linda Johnson of the archives and the, the other folks here at the State Archives and to Barbara Berrigan Perea, Brian Smith and Nora Kovaleski who and, and other members of the crack team at Restore the Delta. Um, and with that, I'll get started. Um, the drought of 1977 forced my family to think differently for a time about how we used water. And I relate a little of that story in my introduction. It got me thinking as a young man about efficient use of water and what that meant. After a few years at UC Santa Cruz, I wrote my senior thesis about democracy and California's then proposed peripheral canal. Since finishing the book and getting it published, I've come to realize that certain key questions guide, guide me as I do research and writing on these topics. First, what roles does climate has climate and environment played in spurring Californians to action on California water problems? Why does drought make Californians so anxious to create and secure reliable water supplies? And what do we mean by reliable? Second, California's early history is colored by the presence of land monopoly, especially in the Central Valley. So I wanted to know what role did land and economic monopoly play in the early history of California water? And what do we mean by reliable, and, and does it still impact us today? It turns out a legacy of monopoly is embedded in the overall design and operation of the Central Valley Project. And it occurred because one monopolist in particular intentionally sought to shape water law doctrine to suit his cattle corporation's purposes. From that came other questions about how Californians responded to Monopoly's influence. What kind of responses did our predecessors here mount? Did any of them deflect or reduce Monopoly's influence? Did these responses create other water problems here in California? My final theme is how do we make peace from the water wars? Do you recall as a child ever being admonished to share? Do you remember knowing how to do that? Did an adult help you figure it out? Sharing is the final thing that motivated me to write this book. I've long been interested in what it takes for adults to figure out how to share common pool resources like housing or water. I, try, I discovered in trying to answer my other key questions through archival research that there were people in the early 20th century who were also interested <clears throat> in how people could share water in California. So I began to weave episodes about the sharing of water that I found through research into my drought book. The episodes are varied, coming as they do from court decisions actual decrees settling water conflicts, groundwater studies, and proposals for water rights law reform. Nature is a main character in my book, taking the form of California's climate. It's the one non-human character in the story beyond anyone's control. 
It appears as both drought in reality and drought as an ever-looming threat to reliable water supplies. The map at left here shows uh, average rainfall in California between about 1962 and 1990. As you can see, typically rainfall and snow melt and snow are concentrated in the northern mountain regions of California, while lower rain amounts are typical of the Central Valley, the central and southern coasts, and the Mojave Desert in the southeast. In contrast to the average climate of California, however, the atmospheric pressure map at the right here shows a ridge of high pressure that blocked the arrival of storms in 1976 and 1977. Chapter one of my book opens by describing the rapid onset of the mid-1970s drought here in California. Most Californians were at the time unaware of the water system that had been created in the previous 50 years. And few understood how we would cope if rain and snow failed here. In response, the state and federal government's allocation of water during the 1970s drought depended on a form of property called water rights. Many water rights came into existence during the California gold rush. I want to read about water rights from the book for you. The dominant type of water right in California is appropriative. One's right to divert and use water is based on the date its holder first put water to use for an economic purpose. Such a right may be handed down from generation to generation, transferred like other more stationary forms of property. These are family or corporate jewels, pre precious assets that may have passed through three, four, five generations in some families, some almost to California statehood in 1850. Buildings rise and decay. Great landed estates subdivide into smaller grids. Companies split or reacquire stock. But make no mistake, water rights, claiming before all the world a certain rate, volume, place, and season, excuse me, of water use, tend toward gravitational stability. Much like the full outer electron shells of nature's noble gases, they can seem inert in the absence of direct, energetic, and compelling confrontation. If they weather the slings and arrows of courtroom rules of evidence and, co and cross-examination, such tested water rights can be one of the most stable, reliable forms of property a corporation or individual can own, providing a benefit stream commensurate with its seniority, first in time, first in right. As one water lawyer has put it, water rights are social policy in dry times. Another way to put, it is, to put this is that water law blames nature for shortages to some and not others through priority date. During the 1970s drought, junior appropriators could lose supplies during the drought while more senior appropriators could continue to divert and irrigate despite the privations imposed on others. These particular flume structures were used to manipulate water already diverted from a stream in Yuba County. They built hydraulic pressure for giant monitor nozzles used to wash down gravel hillsides in the mother load. These flumes were probably built on the strength of an appropriation of water from a river, a nearby river or stream. My next theme is monopoly. Economists tend to define a monopoly as a market actor with the capacity and power to restrict supply or manipulate demand so as to increase prices and profits. Rather than go the route of economic analysis, I chose in chapter two to show readers what Monopoly accomplishes by recalling what it is like to play the board game Monopoly.
Capitalism's central profit motive is easily grasped as the game proceeds. It does not really matter for educating the young that Monopoly's invisible hand is found in the role of dice rather than through investment in lobbyists or favorable laws. The competitive existential fear and insecurity the game induces is a palpable virtual analog to life under real capitalism. Monopoly the game teaches at least two other lessons of economics, one about the pivotal importance of acquiring and controlling property in economic life, and another about how organizing property into strategic blocks can lead to greater profits by restricting competition from other economic actors. Playing Monopoly also demonstrates the real estate truism of location, location, location. The idea that property value derives from the physical placement or position of a property relative to the advantage and disadvantages of, excuse me, of others. As in monopoly, so in life. Power of location, design, and priority are claims on the economy, ecology, and political features, excuse me, political future of watersheds. In the monopoly board of early California, gold rush miners trespassed onto federal public domain lands where they asserted possessory control of Sierra mining regions. Not long after, organized corporate interests assumed dominance first of the mines and soon after the fertile and most easily irrigated lands of the Central Valley. One of those corporate interests was this, was this gentleman, Henry Miller. He led Miller and Lux for some 60 years. Miller was born in the 1820s in Germany and immigrated to New York to escape his family's poverty. Then, like so many other men, he was drawn by the gold rush to California. Miller acquired his company's land and water rights by various, sometimes questionable, means. He hijacked a western San Joaquin Valley irrigation and canal scheme of other monopolists and made it his own. He litigated to deflect California's legal doctrine of water in the service of his corporation's hydrologic assets. His company, Miller & Lux, eventually came to own one and a half million acres by the early 20th century in three western states. And this, this map from uh, a biography of Henry Miller uh, shows uh, these, these lands here in the western and southern San Joaquin Valley, uh, western Nevada, and southeastern Oregon. And I have a passage for you about Miller and Lux. As the largest riparian landowner along the San Joaquin River, Miller and Lux pressed its advantages relentlessly. The company based its cattle production scheme first on wild irrigation, the right to free or inexpensive water, and second, through shrewd dealing with the San Joaquin and Kings River Canal and Irrigation Company syndicate for a canal right of way across Miller land. Thus, Miller and Lux came to own over 100 miles of canals. The canals it obtained and those the corporation subsequently built delivered water cheaply and reliably, though less so to its public customers. In successfully defending its water rights in the many California Supreme Court cases it brought, Miller and Lux arguably exerted undue influence <coughs> over the development of California water law commensurate, at least for a time, with its monopoly power in the Western beef market and the world of San Joaquin and Kern River hydrology. Through its quest for cheap and reliable water, the cattle company consolidated its control of San Joaquin River water as the basis for its many hydraulic privileges. Chapters five through seven in the middle of the book 
describe how California has responded in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to intractable land and water monopoly. They responded in several ways. They developed groundwater and litigated over its protection for community purposes. Use of groundwater, initially from artesian freely flowing sources and later through groundwater pumping, enabled individuals and families to settle the land and build lives in farming and ranching, like in this Carlton Watkins photo here. They also gained control, state control, of permitting for water rights. They devised and built new institutions called irrigation districts. And they devised a state-led process for creating water commons through court decrees that settled water conflicts. Yet another response by Californians was constitutional. Drought and fear of Miller and Lux's land and water monopoly in the San Joaquin Valley made for combustible water politics in the 1920s, a story that opens chapter seven of my book. First, drought. The 1929 to 34 drought was the worst in California's history at the time. But the dry period actually began about 1917, which contributed to California's pent up water angst in the 20s. Moreover, 1924 was the driest single year on record in California's history until the drought of the mid-1970s. Second, litigation was the lit match put to a tinder dry populace. A 1926 California Supreme Court decision in Hermanghaus v. Southern California Edison <coughs> Company made clear that nothing in California water law required that riparian water right holders like Miller and Lux use water reasonably with respect to their appropriative water right holding neighbors. The public revulsion triggered by this decision led to voter passage of a constitutional amendment that gave California a new and very important doctrine that all water in California shall be used to the fullest extent of which it is capable and that there must be no waste or unreasonable use or method of diversion of water. This doctrine is now called the reasonable use doctrine, appropriately enough. It was approved by California voters in November 1928 by a nearly four to one margin. I'm just curious, how many of you knew that we voted, uh, that California voters did that in 1928? Show of hands, okay, there's a few of you, great. It was a complete, uh, an utter surprise to me when I learned that. About the same time, a declining Miller and Lux corporation began bequeathing its San Joaquin water rights to four private water companies it had created. They would eventually become known as the exchange contractors. In reaction to inflamed water politics, San Francisco water rights lawyer Samuel C. Wheel issued this pamphlet shown here that addressed the implications of the 1926 court decision and proposed solutions to it. He also warned that while the reasonable use doctrine is needed in California, the new dams and canals of the then coming Central Valley project would introduce a new monopoly presence in California water politics, government itself. Wheel predicted for downstream water right holders that the price of reasonable use in water law doctrine in the era of dam building and canal diversion is eternal vigilance regarding those controlling flow from upstream, those owning and operating dams. Implementing the new constitutional amendment would mean greater state government exercise of its constitutional power to police water. The architecture of a dam anchored in its channel site invites monopoly control of the river's flows by the dam owner. By force of geography, he argued, the aggressor is above. While the upper installation by its dam has possession of the water, the lower party never has more than the basis for a lawsuit. He has only an argument, while his opponent, 
his opponent's dam has possession of the water. And a lawsuit is a poor match for a dam as a means by which water can be secured. In sum, there were several institutional and legal responses to water monopoly devised by Californians in this period, and by this period I mean about 1855 roughly to about uh, 1920, 25, something like that, 26, 28, sorry. The final one of this era, the Central Valley Project itself would become the technological response to monopoly. It incorporated the monopolized water rights of Miller and Lux in order to overcome the naturally scarce surface water supplies of the San Joaquin Valley. So many passages, so little time. Four public and private entities called exchange contractors retain paramount riparian and senior appropriative rights to the San Joaquin River that date to the mid-1850s. Their corporate lineage descends from original control by the Miller and Lux Cattle Corporation of vast acreage along the river and an important canal system inaugurated by other early California movers and shakers. Some of their rights, the less reliable ones that relied on wet year flood flows to marshy grasslands in the San Joaquin Valley, were sold permanently through a purchase contract to the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. The exchange contractors' most reliable rights are at the core of the Central Valley Project, and this project's key rights are still privately held. They are essentially on long-term loan to the Bureau of Reclamation from these contractors. The loan or exchange of these rights was executed in a 1939 exchange contract. Thus, a public-private partnership lies at the heart of California's largest water project, but the private side had the stronger grip in the handshake. To benefit from all the Miller and Lux descendants' rights in this area, those purchased and exchanged the Bureau built two important reservoirs and two major aqueducts during the 1940s and early 1950s. Shasta Dam on the upper Sacramento River northwest of Redding, Friant Dam northeast of Fresno on the San Joaquin River, and the Delta Mendota Canal linking the South Delta near Tracy with the Mendota Pool on the San Joaquin. Artificial cascades of exportation followed these purchase and exchange contracts. San Joaquin River snowmelt collected at Friant Dam so that the river's flow, once claimed by Miller and Lux, could be diverted into the Friant Kern Canal for irrigation along its 165-mile journey to Bakersfield. My final theme is about sharing about making and keeping peace out of water competition and conflict. Adjudication is a key arrow in the quiver of the would-be water peacemaker. Adjudication is a suit filed in court to determine water rights in a river or groundwater basin. Chapter 10 spotlights important writings that I believe still speak to how Californians might think about resolving water conflicts in the future. One essay was by Mr. Wheel, whose voice you've already heard. The other was authored by Henry Holsinger, a staff attorney with the California Water Project Authority. In 1942, he issued an impassioned plea for adjudicating the Sacramento River's water rights, including those of the Federal Central Valley Project. To conclude, I intended this book to increase understanding about where our water conflicts originated and to show how some of our elders sought peace or at least how they thought about how to achieve it. To conclude, uh, if we are free to, to free ourselves from endless California water wars, I think it's useful to understand where they originate and what our institutions can help us achieve if we summon the courage and resources that are needed. 
that's enough about the, my book for the moment. Normally, this would be my thank you and good night slide. But I want to spend a few slides telling you about archives, sources, and materials I used for the drought book, and some I hope to use in another book that I plan. I found this image with its caption on the back in Governor Earl Warren's papers here at the State Archives on March 24th, 2015. I promptly forgot about it until the following January. Because the Delta Mendota Canal has an important role in the book of supplying the exchange contractors with replacement water from Shasta Dam, it seemed logical to me to suggest this photo once I found it again uh, to, uh, to the University of Nevada Press when they asked me if I had any ideas for the, the cover. I was tickled. I was tickled when their designers and the press director, Justin Race, were thrilled to see it. Later that month, the archives granted me permission to use it. Let me just say to the archives in your presence, thank you from me and, and also to Governor Warren. May he rest in peace. A big thank you to Governor Earl Warren. <clears throat> Another tip of my hat goes to archivist Jeff Crawford. In 2015, Jeff advised and assisted me with obtaining the transcript, two useful map exhibits, and several briefs of the California Supreme Court decision in Katz v. Walkinshaw, a landmark groundwater decision in 1903. I use these materials extensively in chapter five of my book. The Katz decision first recognized overlying rights to a groundwater basin, and that these same rights were correlative with respect to each other. That is, they established rights to shares of the basin's yield, not absolute quantities. And they form a key basis for adjudication of groundwater basins generally today. Citations to cats that I have read do not delve deeply into the facts of the case. I decided after reviewing what Mr. Crawford sent me that I would do a deeper dive. The archives materials revealed much more context than I expected. Even though they did not operate in San Bernardino Valley where the Katz case originated, Miller and Lux's attorney, the firm, the law firm Houghton and Houghton, submitted a 144 page brief surveying groundwater law in other states during the rehearing of the case early in 1903. They attempted to convince the court that landowners owned in an absolute sense all the groundwater they could pump, a Latin legal phrase known as cugis est solum. This and other briefs account for the interest of the several private water companies in rehearing and clarifying the 1902 Katz decision. A great deal of groundwater exploitation was occurring in the southern San Joaquin Valley and southern, southern California by private water companies, and including Miller and Lux. They hoped to exploit desert aquifers further, unconstrained by correlative rights of other overlying <laughs> landowners in the basin or in the region, or by requirements of sustained yield of the underlying groundwater basin itself. In addition, through the CATS materials I received from Mr. Crawford, I learned the briefed arguments that then Associate Justice Lucien Shaw relied on to write the court's opinion. And this is the final passage I will burden you with today. Miller and Lux's attorney, Houghton and Houghton, argued to the court that it had become a rule of property in California that there are no correlative rights as to underground, wa underground waters, and that a landowner has an absolute property in and dominion over all waters percolating in the soils owned by him. C.C. Haskell, attorney for the plaintiffs, alleged that the larger context was that defendant Margaret Walkinshaw diverted her water to benefit lands elsewhere, and that speculators such as Riverside Water Company were carrying away San Bernardino water to other places. The vast San Bernardino Valley Reservoir, he contended, and I quote, 
is being actively exhausted, if not absolutely destroyed. The testimony shows that when the supply is sufficiently reduced, there is nothing to prevent these water corporations with millions of money at their command from converting the entire artesian basin into an arid desert. When Riverside, Colton, Bloomington, and East Riverside Irrigation Company or Irrigation District, all takers of water from the Artesian Basin, have driven their tunnels 150 feet below the surface and have destroyed this rich agricultural valley for all useful purposes, there would be nothing to prevent a more powerful corporation with more capital from driving a tunnel 200 feet beneath the surface and taking the water to the arid lands north and east of Chino and drying the orange orchards of Riverside and other communities dependent upon the water supply. The defendant contends that anyone may capture it who can, that might gives right. Taking up the briefs for rehearing Katz, Justice Shaw found a misconception of the extent to which the common law is adopted in California and a failure to observe some of the rules and principles of the common law itself. He added, the true doctrine is that the common law by its principles adapts itself to varying conditions and modifies its own rules so as to secure the ends of justice under the different circumstances. Justice Shaw summed up that adaptability this way, and I quote, whenever it is found that the application of a given common law rule by our courts tends constantly to cause injustice and wrong rather than the administration of justice and right, then the, found the fundamental principle of right and justice and which its administration is intended to promote require that a different rule be adopted, one which is calculated to secure to persons in their property and possessions and to preserve them, the fruits of their labors and expenditures. Justice Shaw argued, finally, that the logic of applying cugis est solum, the idea of absolute property in groundwater, posed a serious danger to California groundwater. If any property right in percolating water is recognized, the task must be abandoned as impossible and those who have, who have valuable property acquired by and dependent on the use of such property must be left to their own resources to secure protection of their property from the attacks of their more powerful neighbors. And failing in this must suffer irretrievable loss that, that might is the only protection. The Katz decision, both Katz decisions, as I recall, uh, were unanimous by the Supreme Court, 9-0 decisions. And all of that material that I've quoted from and, and done a narration of um, came from these archives. I plan to open my next book with a, an account of Governor Earl Warren's California Water Conference of December 1945. This book I plan to cover the period from the end of World War II to the drought of the 1970s. Warren would of course go on, go on to become a pivotal 20th century U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice, but he is not often thought of as a water governor during his time in California government. <laughs> I respectfully suggest to historians working with this governor that Earl Warren is important to state water issues. If anything, his water legacy was largely thwarted by World War II rationing and post-war politics in California and Washington, D.C. I've decided to use material from the conference proceedings, which incidentally is about 500 pages long. He, he, he was committed to having everybody's views represented and transcribed uh, from this conference. It's quite a, quite a document, um, but I didn't get it here, sorry. Um, I've decided to use material from those proceedings to draft a chapter that helps frame the outlook for California water development and growth coming out of the end of World War II, because that is what Governor Warren sought to do by calling and organizing this conference. Related to the conference, there's also brief but revealing letter exchange in Governor Warren's archives here 
between the governor himself and Dan Hadsall, a friend, excuse me, a friend of Warren's and an attorney for water agencies in the San Joaquin Valley. And I need a water break. Pardon me. Their letters were about the character and scope of the conference, as well as Warren's leadership on water issues. The late and esteemed California historian Kevin Starr once observed that Earl Warren as governor kept very few papers and wrote even fewer letters. In this instance, retaining this correspondence in his letters may reflect a governor conscious of his eventual water legacy. In the letter, he appears to be quite well informed and ably defends the, purposes, the purpose of the conference to his friend who questioned it. In the centerpiece of Governor Warren's conference program appears this lovely map with its black ocean, oblique perspective, yellow-green border, and proposed hydraulic features. It brims with excitement and whimsy. I, I intend to seek permission from the state archives to reproduce it in this future book. You're on notice. <laughs> Both the state and federal governments were quite fond of these oblique artistic renderings of California topography within, within which they could place their projects. They represent a view we take for granted in the age of aerial and satellite photographs, geographic information systems, and Google Earth. <clears throat> I also plan to use materials from the archives collection of Central Valley Flood Control Association records. These materials will help me tell the story of what became of Henry Holsinger's 1942 call for adjudication, which I wrote about and I mentioned earlier in my drought book. In all, I am truly grateful for the presence and availability of the California State Archives and for its professional staff. Archives resources enable writers like me to help deepen historical narratives and reveal new ones about California. And I'm indebted to the taxpayers of California and the Secretary of State for protecting such an historical record and, and uh, I'm sorry, let me try that again. And the, and the Secretary of State for protecting such an historical record as the public's heritage and collective story. I'll take questions now. Thanks. This is now my, or that was my uh, thank you and good night slide. Thank you.